Hello everybody, welcome to the third chapter and our final one in our energy unit. It's going to be chapter 14, which is going to take a closer look at the electron transport chain, um, the mitochondria, as well as what's happening within the chloroplast in plants and other photosynthetic organisms. This chapter is entitled Energy Generation in Mitochondria and Chloroplast. And without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at what the content is going to be about. Three main items to discuss in this chapter. Um, the first one is a continuation of the mitochondria and the oxidative phosphorylation. The oxidative phosphorylation, remember, occurs during the electron transport um, chain, so we're going to explore that a little bit more, which obviously is located within the inner mitochondrial membrane, as we've discussed in chapter 13. And the second topic is going to take a look at the actual mechanism of the electron transport. So what are the steps that are involved and how does that include things like proton pumping, the role that ATP synthase will play in it, and adjustment of pH and alteration of the charges inside and outside of the mitochondria. So we're going to take a look at it more on a step-by-step -step basis. Very similar to how we broke down the steps for glycolysis and the Krebs cycle in uh, chapter 13. And then last but not least, and this will be in part two of our lecture for chapter 14, we're going to take a look at the chloroplast and how the structure of the organelle is perfect for the utilization of photosynthesis, which is of course the process that autotropes such as plants will utilize to extract energy from the sunlight and be able to create, or I should say generate, their own food in the uh, form of glucose molecules. Now, one of the things that we discussed in Chapter 13 was the fact that when you take a look at ATP production, there are basically two main mechanisms that can be utilized. You can have substrate-level phosphorylation, which is simply adding a high-energy phosphate onto an ADP molecule and thereby allowing you to form the charged ATP molecule. And then you have oxidative phosphorylation. And oxidative phosphorylation, as we have encountered it before in our previous chapter, that is the process that's utilized within the electron transport chain of cellular respiration to generate the ATP molecules, mostly based on the fact that you have um, activated carriers such as NADH and FADH2 that will release their electrons into the inner mitochondrial membrane and through a series of steps will be able to harvest that energy and transfer it over to the utilization of ATP molecules. Now, in addition of requiring energy from an activated carrier to get the ATP molecule formed, something else that oxidative phosphorylation will require is that it will require a membrane. It is a membrane-based system, and what we're going to explore in this chapter is exactly what happens within the membrane that's so essential for this step to successfully occur. And we see that the membrane-based oxidative phosphorylation um, is the perfect end to our cellular respiration because as you can take a look in figure 14.1, this process all started off with extracting the energy from our food. And through the step of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, we see that we finally get through our electron transport chain, um, which can therefore use this energy that was derived from the food to ultimately generate what we like to call a proton gradient. So here you have a representation of your proton gradient where your H molecules are being pumped across the membrane. And as they're being pumped across the membrane, what's going to occur is that they're going to go ahead and they will create a proton gradient. The proton gradient is a source of potential energy. And with the gradient, it simply means that you have a high concentration on one side and a low concentration on the other side of the membrane. Now, this form of potential energy can then be utilized to be pumped through the ATP synthase, which is the enzyme that the electron transport chain utilizes. And these protons can then be pumped through the gradient, utilizing the ATP synthase. And as the end result, we see the formation of our ATP molecule. Now, if we were just looking at two thirds of this drawing right over here, then we would be perfectly fine in just including the mitochondria. But it turns out that if we want to go ahead and involve the chloroplast 
we'll take a look at the end part of the drawing right over here. We see that the chloroplasts, through the use of photosynthesis, do a very similar process in the fact that it will utilize a membrane-based mechanism to go ahead and also pump protons through utilizing its gradients form and as it's doing this this is all being fueled by energy from the sunlight which is on its way to being converted um, and being utilized to build the sixth carbon molecule that is glucose so your mitochondria and your chlor and well you don't have any chloroplast but the mitochondria and the chloroplast organelles will have a lot in common especially in their methods of using utilizing energy from proton transfers um, and require the use of a membrane based system so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and explore that in this chapter a little bit further all right now when we take a look at the formation of ATP within the electron transport chain and keep in mind that your book likes to call the electron transport chain it likes to just call it um, the oxidase of phosphorylation so if you see it's mentioned that way it's the same process we're taking a look at the end part of cellular respiration what we see happening is that within that particular step this is where the most amount of ATP is going to be generated and the whole process is basically two stages that need to be completed. The first stage is that you have your input of your NADH and FADH activated carriers, which need to come into the inner mitochondrial membrane and they need to drop off their high energy electrons. And as they're dropping off their high energy electrons, what we're seeing is that they're gonna start fueling a proton pump and that is gonna allow the protons to flow into the inner mitochondrial membrane. And as they're doing so, it's gonna create a gradient. So over here it says you have a proton electrochemical gradient, meaning that you have an area of a high concentration and a low concentration. And we're gonna go ahead and utilize that pump to get them to be inside of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Remember, this is a membrane bound event. Now, it turns out that that will be the end of stage one. So we use the energy of the electron transport to pump the protons across the membrane. In step two, what we see is that the protons will naturally flow back down their electrochemical gradient. So if you think about the process like diffusion, we always go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Um, because that is part of our passive transport. So that's kind of like the natural flow that we like to go the pathway of least resistance. So utilizing their flow, their, in, their ability to flow back down their electrochemical gradient, so from high to low, what we see happening is we're going to couple that through the use of a protein pump. But in this case, it's a protein enzyme that is ATP synthase. And the ATP synthase is going to be able to harbor the energy that is being released as the protons pass through the membrane. And instead of losing that energy as heat, we can go ahead and capture it in the form of an ATP molecule. So as you can see here, it says step two is the energy in the proton gradient is harvested by ATP synthase to make ATP. If we didn't have the ATP synthase here, then the majority of that energy would be lost as heat, which is definitely what we do not want. Now, this process um, is present in many organisms, and we also see that if we were to compare it in a bacterial species, it would look very similar in its format as well as in its process. And part of that can be done based on the fact that the mitochondria and the chloroplast um, share many features with their bacterial ancestors. Remember the endosymbiotic theory? that said billions of years ago, these two organelles, the mitochondria and the chloroplast, were their own living entity, and they were engulfed by a larger host cell that basically made it part of its genome. So it would make sense that there are still ancestral cells, um, ancestral, well, offsprings there that are able to go ahead and complete the same processes because they all come from the same original cell. Now keep in mind that one of the things that we see that's unique for both mitochondria and chloroplast is the fact that they will have a double membrane. The inner membrane belonged to the original cell. The outer membrane was put there most likely by the host and they will also be able to, ha um, to hold on 
to their own DNA. Even if we look at things as the methods of replication that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts use, they have a lot more in common with prokaryotic cells than they have in eukaryotic cells. Now, the DNA that is being housed in the chloroplast as well as the mitochondria, we do see that it has its own ability to, in essence, um, maintain the organelle, replicate the organelle, but it seems that it will mute a lot of its genes because it will still follow directions from the nucleus and thereby it will be able to determine exactly the rate of its ATP production or its rate of its photosynthetic reaction. Here's a little closer look at the mitochondria. This organelle has a very unique feature. So over here, this is our illustration. We can see that what they've done is they've given you a little nice drawing on the left, and then utilizing the electron microscope, we can see the organelle on the right, and there's basically four areas you wanna take a look at. The first one is just a space that's going to be called the matrix. Now, the matrix is all this open space that you see around here. And within that open space, usually you'll have different enzymes that are floating around. So all the enzymes that we were talking about when we were looking at um, um, the citric acid cycle, you know, um, um, all the for in, involved in the eight steps, those are all floating around. So the oxidation of the pyruvate, as well as the fatty acids, all the enzymes you require for the citric acid cycle can be floating around or floating around within the matrix. Then, looking at the border of the organelle, you're going to have the inner membrane. The inner membrane is folded into what they like to call cristae. Cristae are going to be these foldings that are going to allow the surface area to be significantly increased. So it makes for a more effective mechanism because you have more area to conduct any type of reactions that you're looking for. So let's see what it says. It says right here, it says the inner membrane will contain the proteins that carry out oxidative phosphorylation. So for instance, your ATP synthase will be embedded within the inner membrane, as well as all the proteins that are required for your electron transport chain. So the inner mitochondrial membrane is the location for your electron transport chain. And it's going to be essential for increasing our ATP production and cellular respiration. We can also see that within the inner mitochondrial membrane, there'll be some transport proteins. And we can utilize that, um, in essence, to allow certain molecules to enter within the mitochondria, something that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Now, you have an inner membrane and then you have an outer membrane. And as you can see, the outer membrane is the one that will come into actual contact with the cytosol and the cytoplasm. Um, let's see what it says. It says it contains large channel forming proteins called porins. Porins um, are going to be utilized for transport mechanism. So to get entities like, for instance, when we do our um, conversion from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, the way acetyl-CoA is going to enter into the mitochondria is through the porins on the outer membrane. The outer membrane is permeable to all molecules of 5,000 Daltons or less. Notice how beyond that, the, the outer membrane of the mitochondria does not have a specific function, and this all leads us to the support of the fact that this membrane was placed on later on, and it's simply to mark to say that this organelle now belongs to the host cell. And then last but not least, we're going to have a tiny bit of space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. We're going to call that the inner membrane space, so you can see it right here. Um, with the indicator on the white area. And this space is also going to house several enzymes. Um, they will utilize ATP. Let's see what it says. It says this space contains several enzymes that use the ATP passing out of the matrix to phosphorylate other nucleotides. It can also contain proteins that are released during apoptosis. That's the program CELDEC. One of those enzymes we're going to talk about in a little bit, and that's going to be cytochrome C. All right, now just a quick reminder. Remember that in order to get all this started, um, everything basically hinged on the fact that we had our glucose molecules. And what we see happening with that is that as the glucose is bro being broken down into pyruvate, it is then converted into acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA can be achieved by obviously taking the traditional route, which is the hydrolysis of glucose. But it can also be get, uh, it would also be achieved by the utilization of the monomers of fats. Either way, what we see happening is that the acetyl-CoA 
will be the one that will enter through the membrane of the mitochondria. See it right here, because remember your cyto, uh, your um, glycolysis step, your first step, takes place in the cytosol. And then we'll see the movement of the pyruvate and the fatty acids through the transitions of the two mitochondrial membrane. And we'll see that they'll be able to be converted into acetyl CoA. That is then the starting point for our citric acid cycle or our Krebs cycle. This step is also going to be known for the fact that it will be able to generate generate NADH and FADH2 molecules, which obviously are going to be our high energy electron carriers. And these we're going to hold on to until we get to the next step, which is going to be our electron transport chain, which is with the movement into the inner mitochondrial membrane. Something that I want you to think about, um, and I probably should have mentioned this before when we were looking at our illustration of the mitochondria, is that if our cells never um, were exposed or obtained a mitochondria, it would severely limit the amount of ATP we are able to extract. Without the mitochondria, you can only really take about 10% of the energy that we find within our food bonds, and we're limited to what we can do within the cytoplasmic region. So for many of the cells that would mean that they would just basically be limited to glycolysis. That would severely limit the energy production in the cell, which then in turn would limit its ability to do work as well as to increase its overall size. So the fact that we're able to have a single cell start off and continue to grow and develop and replicate and proliferate and generate a complex organism such as the human body requires a massive amount of energy. And that would not have been done without the insertion of the mitochondria into our cells. The other thing to think about is that each of our cells, well, I should say, if you take a look at the different types of cells, so like our heart cells, our muscle cells, um, our skin cells, they will slightly have different amounts of mitochondria, and the mitochondria can be located in different parts of the cytoplasmic content. It really all has to do with what the overall function of the cell is. So I don't think it would surprise anybody that if I were to compare, for instance, um, a cardiac muscle cell which you find in the heart, and you compare that to a skin cell, both of them will have mitochondria, but the heart cells will have a boatload more mitochondria. Um, in fact, the mitochondria takes up about 25% of the cytoplasmic area in a um, cardiac muscle cell, in a heart cell. And the reason for that is because the heart has to pump every 0.8 seconds. So it needs a massive amount of chemical energy to keep it going. We can't have our heart get fatigued because that could be detrimental for our health and our overall li uh, livelihood. Um, the other thing that we do see is that you are able to alter the amount of mitochondria that you have in your individual cells. So for instance, um, someone who is very athletic, um, has nicely conditioned, we see that on average their cells, especially their muscle cells, will have a higher amount of mitochondria than someone who doesn't really exercise, um, is maybe a little bit lethargic. It really will all depend on what your overall ATP demands are for the body based on things like your size, your age, your health, and obviously also your overall activities. There have also been certain diseases that have been seen um, if there is a mutation within the mitochondria. Now remember that your mitochondria is inherited from um, your mother, so what we see happening is that we keep a close eye on it to see if there's any mutations. And if there are mutations, what are some of the ways that we can treat it? And one of the options is what they like to call mitochondrial replacement therapy. Um, this one was successfully completed for the first time, I believe, in 2016. And what they do is they basically extract an egg from a female patient who's interested in having children, and that patient might have some issues with her mitochondria. So through mitochondria replacement therapy, they're able to remove the organelle from the patient's cell, her little oocyte, and then they will find a second donor who will also give an oocyte, and the mitochondria from that oocyte is then inserted into patient's number one egg. They will do in vitro fertilization thanks to the donation of sperm or the contribution of sperm. And then when the zygote is successfully formed, they will eventually transplant it into the uterus, whether it's going to be the genetic mother or the use of a surrogate.
Either way, what we'll see is that when the baby is um, starts to develop, we'll see that it has DNA from two sources because its nuclear DNA, the DNA within its nucleus, will come from its genetic mother and genetic father, whereas the DNA that is found housed in the mitochondria will come from the second female donor. So that's a pretty cool thing to kind of consider um, your different sources of DNA access. Now, when we take a look at the movement of our electrons, and I know for some of you this is going to seem a little bit of overkill because we're repeating the concept um, a little bit. It's, it's a little um, repetitive on my end as well. But it's really just to kind of highlight the fact that these movements of the electrons are so essential and that they're coupled to the pumping of the uh, protons. So what we see happening here is that something that we've mentioned before, which is that when you take a look at the movement of your electrons, the energy that's being housed within your NADH and FADH2 molecules can quickly pass along the chain. And as it's passing along the chain, its energy is being used to basically uh, fuel a proton pump. Here's my little proton pump. So here I can see that my NADH is releasing its electrons, and the electrons will then go into a little proton gradient. And as they're doing this, what's happening is that we start releasing the electrons as it's moving down to a uh, lower energy source. And this can happen quickly and also very effectively because remember it turns out that when you do aerobic respiration, our final electron acceptor is going to be oxygen and that is going to maximize the amount of ATP that we're able to produce at the end of all of this because what we see happening and you can further see it happening here within the mitochondrial illustration is that we are utilizing the FADH and the NADHs that we were able to generate within the citric acid slash Krebs cycle. We're basically using that energy to go ahead and produce ATP at the end of the electron transport chain. So they really are a coupled reaction. And keep in mind that as it's being passed down, the electrons are being passed down, they are creating a proton gradient. And that proton gradient is one of the reasons why we can utilize the ATP synthase which will allow us to transfer the energy from your protons as it's gliding down the concentration gradient to harvest that energy into our ATP molecules, thereby completing our step of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so let's just see, it says right here, it says the movement of electrons is coupled to the pumping of protons, yes, because that's gonna help us create the gradient. NADH and FADH will donate electrons to the electron transport chain. Yes, in fact, these are the inputs the required reagents that we need for that final step, the electron transport chain, to get started. This is, of course, happening within the inner mitochondrial membrane because we require a membrane pro uh, step process to get the oxidative phosphorylation completed. Um, because we're doing aerobic respiration, oxygen is going to be our final electron acceptor. That is also one of the reasons why we're able to generate H2O as a waste product of our aerobic respiration. And as you can see right here, the pumping of the protons across the membrane will be one of the ways that we can fuel the activation of the ATP molecules at the end of doing our cellular respiration. So here, for instance, is an example of how we are doing a coupling process where you basically have the conversion of energy from your electrons in your activated carriers of your NADH and FADH2, and we're basically converting that over to the um, activation of your phosphate added to your ADP molecules. Um, let's see what's happening. Now, the mitochondria is going to be extremely important in this step because it's going to catalyze this reaction, so it's going to allow us to lower the activation energy and get it done um, at a faster rate. It's also going to increase our efficiency to produce our ATP molecules. And if we take a look at the picture, we can see right here something that um, I've been stating on previous slides, as well as in previous chapters now, is that the energy in our activated carrier, NADH, is going to get released. And as it gets released, 
That energy is then converted or utilized for the oxidative phosphorylation and the ultimate formation of your ATP molecule. Now, please keep in mind that as the NADH goes in and releases its high energy electron, what's left behind is going to be your uncharged NAD and your water molecule as a waste product. And on the other hand, the, way the, the reason we're able to generate ATP is not only because we are able to convert the energy from NADH, and not only because we're utilizing an inner membrane, but also because we are requiring our uncharged molecule, which is our ADP, to go ahead and bind to a phosphate molecule. And by binding with that third one, we're able to generate a lot of chemical energy in the form of our quote-unquote charged molecule ATP. Now, as we take a closer look at the movement, um, we see that the high energy electrons, when they're being transferred across the inner mitochondrial membrane, we see that the chain, the electron transfer chain, is basically composed of over 40 different proteins. And these proteins are collectively grouped into three large respiratory complexes, which is what you see featured right over here. So this is basically taking a look at the composition of our electron um, transport chain. Now, these um, respiratory complexes, in order from beginning to start, are going to be our NADH dehydrogenase complex. So that will be the first one that will be able to accept the electrons from your NADH and your FADH2. Then we're going to go ahead and move on to cytochrome C reductase complex. Cytochrome C reductase complex is then going to be followed by cytochrome C oxidase complex. The cytochrome C oxidase complex will be the last respiratory complex that the electrons will come across to. At that point, they will also have to interact with the oxygen molecule thereby generating their H2O molecule as waste, as well as all of the ATP molecules that will be able to be formed due to the burst of energies that the electrons have released as they literally hop from one respiratory complex to the other. In addition, what we see happening is that oftentimes these respiratory complexes will have metal ions um, like cytochrome C, ubiquitin, and these metal ions, or they could be different chemical groups, what's going to happen is that they act almost like a little um, stepping stone. So it's going to assist the electron to hop and skip from one respiratory complex into the next one. And this entire step of moving from um, NADH dehydrogenase complex the cytochrome C reductase complex, the cytochrome C oxidase complex. This is a very energy favorable movement because what's happening is as the electrons are moving from beginning to end, it's basically lowering its overall energy state. And that is then what's accounting for the little burst of energies that we're able to utilize for our hydrogen, our proton pumping, and our fueling of our ATP synthesis in step number two, where the actual ATP molecules are going to be um, generated. Because remember, all this that you see right here, this is also accompanied by the pumping of the protons, forming our proton pump. We also see that we are able to generate an, um, an electrochemical proton gradient, right? Because our proton pump is going to allow us to create a high versus a low concentration if we take a look at um, across what's happening across our inner mitochondrial membrane. Now, it turns out that as we do our electrochemical proton gradient, we can also slightly alter the pH on the inside versus the outside of your mitochondrial membrane. And the reason for that is very simple. At the core, when you take a look at the pH of a solution, we are comparing hydrogens versus hydroxide. So as you can see, a proton is just a fully charged hydrogen ions. And what we see happening here is that as the proton pump starts to work, we notice that we have a high accumulation of hydrogens within the inside of it. So we start to see that that pH becomes slightly more acidic. 
In fact, take a look right here on your right-hand side of your diagram and notice that they wrote for you that the pH is 7.2 on the in the inner membrane space, so the inside of the inner mitochondrial membrane, whereas on the outside, which would be the little matrix, it has a pH of 7.9, and that's due to the fact that it has slightly less hydrogens on that side, so it drives the pH um, to be altered. The other thing that we see is that because the hydrogens have a charge, they are able to generate um, what we like to call the electrical gradient, right? That's the electro part of electrochemical gradient. That means that they're going to go ahead and they'll be able to generate a charge across the membrane. And the proton motifs that we could see right over here, it says the electrochemical hydrogen gradients across the inner mitochondrial membrane includes a large force due to the membrane potential and a small force due to the proton concentration gradient. And that is then where the pH, the change of pH, is being utilized. Now, collectively, we see right here in pink, we see the formation of more of a positive charged environment on the inside and more of a negative charge environment on the outside. And that is going to allow us to create a membrane potential. So it's going to create um, a quote-unquote charge, very similar to a battery, that you'll have a positive end and a negative end. And collectively, what we can see is that we can go ahead and take the membrane potential, and we can also take the change in pH, and we will combine that together to create what we like to call the proton motive force. So your membrane potential and your ch uh, change in pH will contribute to your proton motive force. And this will, in essence, allow us to pull the hydrogen across the membrane. And that then is our contribution or what contributes, in essence, to the ability to generate our ATP molecules at the end. So our electrochemical hydrogen gradient the fact that we can get those hydrogens to move is a combination or is the result of a combination of a change in membrane potential, because they do carry a charge, as well as a change in pH. And that obviously has to do with the fact that you start to imbalance the amount of hydrogens versus hydroxide ions. And this is all collectively pulled into what we like to call the proton motive force. All right, here we go. Proton motive force. Beautiful. Now, we keep talking about this ATP synthase, right? And I have mentioned to you before in Chapter 13, this is what we like to call um, a universal enzyme because every single cell that has it, the it, enzyme looks exactly the same and it functions the same. And the ATP synthase is basically the final enzyme we encounter on our way of harvesting our ATP molecules. And by now, hopefully, you have come to terms with the fact that it's driven by two steps, right? Well, it's the second step of the process. The first step was the removal of the high energy electrons from your NADH and FADH2 and utilizing that for our proton pump. And now we're harvesting that energy and we're going to go ahead and get our protons due to their electrochemical gradient to move down the gradient and use that potential energy to harvest or to utilize the use of your ATP synthase so the energy can be converted into ATP molecules. Now, something that's very interesting to point out about the ATP synthase is that it actually can have um, a reverse coupling effect. So go ahead and take a look at your picture, and you can see that on the left-hand side, under A, you have your ATP synthesis, which is what we've been talking about thus far as to how it functions. So you have your protons that funnel through, and as they funnel through, we're basically taking their energy and we're converting it into an ATP molecule. So there's our oxidative phosphorylation. Well, it turns out that because our body has such an extensive um, need for ATP molecules, and it always has a high ratio of ADP molecules around, it carefully monitors that ratio, and it will also carefully monitor um, the amount of energy that's being generated from the glycolysis, the citric acid, and the step one 
or the stage one of your electron transport chain. And if we see that the change is that there's a change in the free energy that's being generated, um, the ATP synthase can actually reverse its course. And instead of generating ATP molecules, it will start hydrolyzing ATP molecules and allowing the flow of your protons to go backwards and back into the inner membrane space. So it can completely rechange or um, flip-flop its um, direction. And when it does so, what we're doing is that we're basically able to generate the hydrogen gradient to the level where we need it to be so that it's generating enough free energy that we can then later on use once again to produce ATP. So your ATP synthase, yes, its main function is the production or the conversion of energy into ATP molecules, but it also has to keep an eye on your proton um, electrochemical gradient. And if it sees that that gradient starts to become diminished, it has an ability to rebuild it by reversing its mechanism. Um, and by doing so, it's going to utilize or hydrolyze ATP molecules so it can restore the electrochemical gradient that's required for full production of ATP molecules. So as you can see, fully reversible, and one depends on the other because it's continuously keeping an eye on your ratio of ATP, ADP, as well as the state of the proton gradient. Now, another thing that I definitely want to add on to it is, and this is where the little porins will come into place, you know, the little openings that you find within the um, outer membrane of the mitochondria, they can be utilized to import different molecules, and those molecules can be used for different things. So obviously, we can utilize it for the movement of acetyl-CoA into the mitochondria so we can continue our cellular respiration. But also what we see happening is that the electrochemical gradient that we're utilizing can also be utilized to get other molecules to enter into the cell that might be used for different processes. So over here, you can see, um, if you take a look, um, follow the arrow. All the arrows that are leading to the inside of the mitochondria, you'll come across other molecules that you might not necessarily need for your um, electron transport chain to be successful. But things like pyruvate, lots of phosphate molecules. We also have the ability to pump in ADP molecules. We obviously need a lot of ADPs so that they can bind together with their phosphate and harvest that energy that's being released by the NADHs and FADH2 and get our ATP molecules. And we see that this electrochemical proton gradient that we rely on for our ETS is not only important for ATP production, but also to allow for other molecules to be transported into the cell. So basically, not an inch, not a little bit of energy that can be utilized is going to waste. We can also utilize the pH gradient to continue the importation of the pyruvate into the matrix of the mitochondria. You can also utilize your pH gradient to drive the phosphate into the matrix. And then over here on top, we see that we can rely on that voltage gradient, you know, the fact that it has a positive um, charge more in its inner membrane space and a negative within the matrix. It can utilize that for the movement of the ADP molecule into the matrix and an ATP molecule out of the matrix. And notice how everything in green right here, this is a coupled reaction. So as one is moving in, it is bringing the other either with it or it's doing a reverse reaction where one comes in and the other one goes out. Either way, it's a coupled reaction. So one relies on the other. The fact that we can utilize um, the movement, um, so we can utilize our voltage gradient and our pH gradient and the porins really show how cellular respiration is truly a very effective mechanism because it's trying to utilize as much of the free energy that it has access to um, and thereby increasing the overall metabolic pathways that the cell is able to um, create. All right, now the other thing I want to mention, and I think if we were face-to-face, -face, this would probably be a question that I usually get when we're talking about the electron transport chain, is that students will say to me, 
okay, I get the electron, like I get where the electrons came from. They were initially forming the bonds for your six carbon glucose. And when you pulled it apart, the electrons were released. So I get that we want to harvest them and we want to use NADH and FADH2 to carry them, right? It's all in the name. They're high energy electron carriers. But how do the electrons correlate with the protons? Because by the time you get into your third step, your electron transport chain, all of a sudden you see the mention of moving electrons, which hopefully still makes sense, right? NADH, FADH2. But now all of a sudden we have protons that are being carried around as well. So how, how is this possible? Well, one of the most, the main reasons why it's possible is because hydrogen is one of the most abundant atoms that we have within living organisms. And that's because most of our entities are carbon-based and we see a lot of it within an H2O water molecule, which we also have a high composition of. But more importantly, what we see happening is that when you do um, an electron transfer, it can easily cause the movement of these hydrogen atoms, these protons, because the protons are so readily accepted or donated to water molecules. So they are so willing and able to interact with H2O molecules, whether they become part of the water molecule or they are released from the water molecule. So if you now step back and you think back to some of the processes that we discussed very early on in lecture, we talked about the fact that at our core, our metabolic system is a collection of a dehydration process and a um, hydrolysis process, right? So when I'm dehydrating or I'm doing my condensation, I'm basically forming my bonds, I'm building my molecules, and as an end result, I generate water, which is then kicked out of the system. Now, when I'm doing my hydrolysis, then now I'm introducing water into the system so I can utilize that as a lysing force, as a force to pull it apart so that I can go from macromolecule to monomer. And the water molecule is so essential because it's, yes, it's a waste product, but it's allowing us to transfer the free energy that we have within our electrons. And with that water will come our protons. So even if you take a look at the illustrations that are on our particular PowerPoint, we see that the coupling or the joining of the electron with the proton makes sense because it will all have to do with the fact that whether we are um, building, so we're doing our dehydration, or we are destroying and releasing our electron and we're doing our hydrolysis, either way what we see happening over here is the fact that there's always a water molecule which means that it allows for the interaction of the proton and the proton can then be used to couple the movement of the electron as well now in the electron transport chain we take it a little bit step further because we said that or i said in order for us to do oxidative phosphorylation, we are going to rely on proteins that are embedded within the membrane. In order for these proteins to be successful, we know that they need to be able to accommodate an electron and the proton because both of them we're going to rely on to complete the two stages of our ETC system. So when you look at your picture right over here, that's towards the right hand side of the PowerPoint. What you're going to notice is that it's showing you three proteins that are embedded within the membrane. These are enzyme processes. So we have A, B, and C. And what you're going to notice when you look at them is besides the fact that you have a cascading mechanism, we start on A and we end with E. We're also going to notice that the uh, protons are set up in a way or organized in a way that they're able to receive the electron and the proton on one side and they're able to accommodate both of these molecules exiting on the other side. So it's almost like you're playing hot potato. You're able to move them collectively. And by being able to move it from one spot to the next, so from uh, a donor to an acceptor, a donor to an acceptor, you're basically able to release small bursts of energies that are being housed within these electrons. And obviously these bursts of energies are what we're gonna to use to keep fueling the movement of the protons.
And over time, we see that when we get to the end of our electron transport chain, then we're going to need to have a final electron acceptor. And that for us is then where our water, our oxygen molecule comes into play, because that is then the one that will be able to receive the end part of the electron transport chain so that we can move on to the second stage, which involves the utilization of the electrochemical um, gradient of the protons and the pumping through of the ATP synthase. One other thing that we see, and this takes us also back to one of our previous discussion, is that remember that when you utilize the motion of the electrons, um, we've been discussing it a lot in the fact that it's able to house energy, but also keep in mind that you have your oxidation reduction reaction that comes into play. So this is why it's so essential that when you take a look at your activated carriers, that we have what we call redox pairs. We want to have one that's going to be a strong donor and the other one that's going to be a weak donor and a strong acceptor. And that, of course, is where you have your quote unquote charged molecule versus your uncharged molecule. So what do I mean with that? Well, when you take a look at ATP, ATP is your charged molecule because it houses the energy. ADP is the uncharged. GTP, charged. GDP, uncharged. So we also see the same thing happening in our NADHs and our FADH2. We see, for instance, and this is what's dedicated on the slide right here, we see that the NADH that's going to be our charged molecule, that's the one that's going to be the strong electron donor. It's able to hold on to the high energy electron, but it's also able to quickly give it away. And then our NADH is going to be more of a low redux potential because it's going to be able to capture that electron so that it can transfer its energy and form the NADH molecule because at the core we see that the electrons move from the pair with a low redox potential to a pair with high redox potential and that is then how we're able to accommodate the movement of the electrons down the electron transport chain and keep in mind that we have to do this or we the cells prefer to do this in a step-by-step -step basis um, because they have so much energy that's being housed that if we were able to do this in one step, it would be such a huge amount of heat release that it would shut down the cell, destroy it. The heat would not be able to be utilized. Whereas if we do it step-by-step, -step, we lower the amount of heat release and we generate a lot more free energy that can be used for things like our anabolic mechanisms that our body so heavily relies on. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention, and I said this to you before, is that when we take a look at our three respiratory groupings that we were talking about previously, trying to find which slide that was, um, when we're taking a look at our respiratory enzyme complexes, our NADH dehydrogenate complex, cytochrome C reductase complex, and cytochrome C oxidase complex, remember that I mentioned to you before that each of them is going to maintain or is going to have is going to obtain a metal ion or another chemical group that's going to allow for your electrons to kind of skip from one step to the next. So this particular slide just kind of takes a look at those particular metal ions and reminds you that we have the ubiquitin and the quinine in photosynthesis, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. And it's going to increase the effectiveness of the electrons moving down the chain. We will also have the utilization of the cytochrome C protein, which I'm very interested in. I'm going to tell you more about that in our next slide. But either way, it will just increase the effectiveness of the electrons being transferred in the electron transport chain. Um, the type of metal used will often depend on how tightly you want the electrons to be bound um, as well as the affinity so the attraction force that you're looking for so for instance um, in iron solver centers you tend to have a relatively low affinity um, and those are what we like to commonly use in most parts of the chain because we want to have a smooth transition from a high energy state to a low energy state
Um, if we take a look at heme groups, which we find in like hemoglobin, so this is what you find in your red blood cells, we're going to find lots of iron. Um, iron will serve as an electron acceptor, um, and then it will basically allow us to create a higher affinity for the oxygen molecule to bind to the red blood cell. So in that case, we want to have a slightly higher affinity to be able to um, accomplish the role of red blood cells being a transport mechanism of oxygen molecules. And by the way, your um, metals that we were just chit-chatting about on the previous slide, they tend to be tightly bond to the proteins. And then, like I said to you before, um, once the electron is donated and it starts moving through the complexes, um, as it moves within the complex, it will literally be able to use the ions as a stepping stone to guarantee its movement down the gradient, thereby allowing its release of um, energy in a more effective way. All right, so um, this is our last slide for part one. It's going to take a look at cytochrome C. I definitely wanted to mention cytochrome C because it plays many different roles. Um, obviously, in our case, we're talking about the fact that the cytochrome C is going to help in the reduction of our um, oxygen molecule, right? Um, it will be the oxygen is the final electron carrier acceptor in the respiratory chain. So cytochrome C, um, the oxidase one, is going to be our final protein complex that you come across. And its goal is to basically hold on to the oxygen molecule and allow it to release its electrons so that it can eventually be converted into water. So here's the little formula for that. You can see the conversion, the removal of the electrons with the protons, mix that with our final electron acceptor, uh, O2, oxygen, and they're allowing for the water molecules to form. Um, something that I wanted to point out about this is that um, within the cytochrome C oxidase, we see that it has a heme group and it has a copper atom. And those will collectively form the site where oxygen is actually being tightly bounded to. Um, and that is where it's kind of waiting for it to receive the four electrons so it can uh, go ahead and produce the H2O molecules. The reason this is so important to point out is because receiving those four electrons is essential. If you only receive two of the electrons, then what we see is that the O2 molecule is actually converted into what we call a free radical. And the free radical can cause a lot of damage, including DNA damage within the cell. Now, part of what the cytochrome C has to monitor is to make sure that there are no free radicals being generated. If it does see that it has a high amount of free radicals um, that start to float around, it increases the chance of a mutation to occur. So in that case, the cytochrome C will actually induce apoptosis, which is that programmed cell death. Um, the reason why I'm so interested in cytochrome C is that part of my PhD study took a look at the induction of apoptosis. And as part of my experiments, I would have to collect my different prostate cancer cell lines and my breast cancer cell lines. And I would have to do differential centrifugation as well as protein purification to isolate my cytochrome C and see if they were being expressed in higher levels in cells that were inducing apoptosis and other cells that were not doing apoptosis but instead we're doing um, necrosis, which is basically the opposite of apoptosis. It's traumatic cell death when the cell literally just massively explodes and causes a lot of inflammation within the program. All right, my apologies. I just got a little bit off track over there, but seeing cytochrome C brought back some graduate memories. All righty. Um, now, I know the concept of energy might be getting a little bit long-winded for you. Hang in there. We're almost done. Um, in our next section, we are going to take a quick look. I'll make it as painless as possible. We're going to take a quick look at the chloroplast and photosynthesis, okay? And we'll see how there are a lot of commonalities within the use of a membrane within the mitochondria as well as within the chloroplast organelle. Alrighty, we shall talk soon and uh, you guys will hear me again for part two. Bye.